a terrible dream. Time to wake up and get back to reality. Welcome to WatchMojo.com, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 TV episodes where it was all a dream. <gasps> I didn't wake up. It's all a dream. It's just a dream. For this list, we're taking a look at episodes where the majority of the story took place within a character's dream or nightmare, or where the plot revolved around a dream or nightmare. We've excluded episodes like Lois Kills Stewie because, as Stewie points out, that was technically a simulation. So what you're saying is that what you experienced in the simulation didn't really happen or even matter? Yes, that's correct. So it was sort of like a dream? No, it was a simulation. Oh, and seeing how we'll be talking about the endings and surprise reveals here, a spoiler alert is probably in order. <laughs> Number 10, The Sting, Futurama. The professor says you're just a dream. Oh yeah? After throwing himself in front of a giant space bee to save Leela, Fry is stung through the gut and killed instantly, after which he receives a send-off worthy of Mr. Spock. We now commend Fry's body to the ages. Consumed by guilt and space honey, Leela endures a series of dreams suggesting that Fry might still be alive. That proves it! Fry is alive somewhere, and he's reaching me in my dreams! Matters only become more surreal as she attempts to decipher what's reality, what's an illusion, and whether she's losing her mind. Are you saying I'm going crazy? In the end, the entire experience turns out to be a coma dream induced by the venom from the bee sting. And, loyal as he is, Fry remained beside Leela the entire time, encouraging her to finally wake up. Fry never left your side for a minute. And he talked non-stop, like a parrot of the sea he was. I thought maybe if you heard a familiar voice, it might help keep your mind together. But who knows if it really got through. It got through, Fry. It got through. Number 9. The Test Dream, The Sopranos. It was just a dream, alright? In this Sopranos episode, Tony examines his regrets, insecurities, and a future he isn't prepared for through one of his many bizarre dream sequences. You know, douchebag, I realize I'm dreaming. I got no opinion. Along the way, he crosses paths with several deceased characters, some of which died by his hands. The Saudi are right, because in the dream, he was the only alive guy in this got full of dead guys. We also get references to everything from the Honeymooners to Bugsy, even working Annette Benning into the equation. Three times a lady. You and Annette Benning. And I, I love don't so. you. The test dream is all over the place and seemingly makes little sense, following the same conventions as real dreams. But also like a real dream, there's a ton of truth waiting to be interpreted underneath all the insanity. <laughs> Number eight, perchance to dream, Batman the Animated Series. My life is a dream, Alfred. The best dream anyone ever had. As much as Bruce Wayne likes to play the martyr role, part of him will always long for a carefree reality where he can be happy. No, you're a lie. It's all a lie. In this episode, named for a line from a well-known speech in Shakespeare's Hamlet, Bruce gets his wish when he wakes up after being knocked out during a battle to learn that his parents are alive. He's engaged to Selina Kyle and someone else is filling in as the Dark Knight. Who, who is he? They call him Batman. No, I mean, who is he? No one knows. He just appeared in Gotham a few weeks ago. As enticing as this life seems, the detective in Bruce can't let his suspicions go. Guy moves like Batman. This episode is an ingeniously plotted mystery that amounts to a thrilling final confrontation in which Bruce discovers the stuff that dreams are made of. Something for the lab boys to play with. Any idea what it is? Yes. The stuff that dreams are made of. Number seven, and then there was Sean, Boy Meets World. Why is Sean so obsessed with you two? Sean Hunter lives and breathes horror flicks, and his knowledge of horror tropes comes in handy throughout this episode of Boy Meets World. As much as this goes against my horror movie instincts, I think we should split up. That way the killer can't get to us all at once. The gang's locked inside John Adams High with a scream-inspired killer. In a story that goes on to parody other franchises like Scooby-Doo, I Know What You Did Last Summer, and more, one kid's impaled through the head with a pencil, Mr. Feeney is stabbed in the back, and some heavy books pummel poor Jennifer Love Hewitt. The episode is of course a dream, but it still cleverly plays into the ongoing story concerning Cory and Topanga's recent breakup. John? Hey, 
So, number six, GI Jeff Community. It doesn't hurt because it isn't real. Good job, Wingman. Thank you, Duke. Everyone remembers a particular Saturday morning cartoon that takes them back to a simpler time. And please don't forget this Saturday is the Cobra Fun Run. If you miss it, you're letting the anti-terrorists win. Unable to handle the idea of turning 40, Jeff envisions a fantasy based on G.I. Joe. Not if G.I. Joe can help it. Roadblock, Deep Six, hold off those his tanks. The dream is complete with advertisements, rehashed animation, and Jeff's friends revamped as Joes. This place is a graveyard for G.I. Joe rejects. Look who's in here. Deep Dish, Shark Arms, Weird Head, Home Free, Placeholder, Sleep Apnea, and us. Eventually, Wingman decides he needs to grow up and ascend to the place where Cobra Commander can't follow. I want to go to this Greendale place now. As we've come to expect from Community and their various out-of-genre episodes, G.I. Jeff is wildly inventive, overflowing with smart meta humor, and poignant in his message about getting old. I had the craziest dream. It was all animated and a G.I. Joe cartoon, and you were all in it? In it? How much? Number five, the impossible dream, Frasier. About that dream I mentioned to you earlier, uh... I guess it goes without saying, I'd rather you didn't share that with anyone else. Oh, sure. When most heterosexual guys have gay dreams, they usually try to forget it and move on with their day. Yes, yes, I had a dream about Gil, and yes, it did have some, some erotic elements, but you have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about, do you? But since Fraser Crane is a psychiatrist, he simply can't ignore an intimate recurring dream involving his flamboyant co-worker, Gil Chesterton. Knock, knock. <laughs> Gil! Frasier, I've come to tempt you. Really? <laughs> Frasier analyzes the purpose behind his dream from every angle, considering his recent diet, childhood trauma, and an uncomfortably Oedipal attraction to his mother. It's the classic Oedipal dream. Yes, yes. Oh, I was so frightened by my sexual urges to be with my mother that I transformed her into a man. <laughs> At last, he comes to a conclusion that the dream was his subconscious's method of challenging him as a therapist. With that mystery solved, Fraser must now turn his attention to his seemingly repressed crush on Sigmund Freud. Dr. Crane, Dr. Sigmund Freud. <laughs> My goodness, sir, it's quite an honor. The honor is all mine. I gave you a complex psychological problem, and you so well. Number four, normal again, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Thank you. If you were the chosen one destined to slay vampires, you'd probably assume you were dreaming at first. We have to break those down. Hey. Yes. Several years after accepting her role as the Slayer, however, Buffy Summers is awoken to the possibility that her life in Sunnydale has been a lie. What is this? Do you know where you are, Buffy? Sunnydale. No, none of that's real, none of it. Instead, she's a delusional mental patient locked away in an institution who must kill all of the friends and family she's invented in her subconscious to become healthy once again. They're not really your friends, Buffy. They're just tricks keeping you from getting healthy. What makes Normal Again especially brilliant is its ambiguous conclusion, which never tells us which reality is true and which one is false. Depending on how you interpret it, Buffy's fate is either incredibly triumphant or absolutely tragic. I'm sorry, there's no reaction at all. I'm afraid we're lost. Number three, the boom. Family Guy. The world is gonna end at midnight tonight. Y2K. This is, without a doubt, one of the strangest episodes of Family Guy, which is saying a lot. Oh, forget the party. The world's gonna end. Y2K. I heard it from a chicken man. Yet, it's also one of the most popular and a classic. Having survived Y2K, the Griffin family embarks into an apocalyptic world of giant rats, cannibalism, and nuclear waste that mutates Stewie into an octopus-like thing. Did you wash your tentacles, my big handsome boy? The devil are you talking about, handsome? I'm repugnant! I'm a radio bloody active freak! But hey, at least a Twinkie factory and Randy Newman have survived. She's right. Besides, this place is paradise. Sure is. Except for Randy Newman. Randy Newman? Yep. Just sits there all night and day, singing about what he sees. It doesn't come as a massive surprise when this episode is revealed to be a dream. What is the surprise is that the person having the dream was Pam Ewing, parodying a classic episode of Dallas. Hey, speaking of which... What's Family Guy? Number two, Return to Camelot, part one, Dallas. Honey, what's the matter? 
You look like you just saw a ghost. Even if you've never seen this classic primetime soap, you've at least heard of Bobby Ewing's infamous revival. Oh, Bobby, it was awful. When I woke up, I thought that you were dead. When Bobby met his demise at the end of season eight, fans were heartbroken. But death is inevitable and there's no coming back from it, right? Not in TV land. It's over. None of that happened. Following a shocking cliffhanger in which Pam discovers her late fiance is in the shower, we learn in Return to Camelot that Bobby's death and all of season nine were merely a dream. Talk about cheating death, not to mention the audience. But whatever, Bobby's back, woo! Before we awaken our top pick, here are a few honorable mentions. Obviously, the devil has a problem with women and a huge problem with mothers. I've had 111 dreams since I first discovered this program nine months ago. In all of that time, I have never experienced such strange and disturbing imagery. Ah! Relax, honey. You were just having a crazy nightmare. Number one, The Last New Heart. You say hello and we say goodbye. <laughs> having a single episode turn out to be a dream is one thing. Having a whole season turn out to be a dream is another thing. This is par for the course, but I know we're not, we're not selling our in. New Heart takes the cake though, when they revealed in this series finale that the entire show was a dream. Because let's face it, this could have been a slap in the face to loyal viewers. Oh heck, just enjoy the show. <laughs> the last scene of The Last New Heart is nothing short of comedy gold, however as Bob Newhart awakes beside his TV wife from his previous series, subsequent to one crazy dream. <laughs> it's an unforgettable twist that brings both Newhart sitcoms full circle and delivers the ultimate practical joke. That settles it. No more Japanese food before you go to bed. <laughs> Do you agree with our list? What TV episodes were beyond your wildest dreams? Right now, we have more important matters. Yep. <laughs> For more entertaining top tens published every day, be sure to subscribe to WatchMojo.com. Oh, that's right. It's all a dream. Or is it? <laughs>